This is the philosophy of George Berkeley, and again, this is just an an introduction to his philosophy. So we're going to discuss very broadly his, his philosophy. So let's start with just a brief discussion on his life and his works. George Berkeley was born in Kilkenny in Ireland in 1685. And he was the son of an English family that had migrated to Ireland. So from England to, to Ireland. He studied at the Trinity College in Dublin, where he remained for a long period as a teacher of theology. In 1709, he became an Anglican pastor. And from 1713, to 1720, he traveled to France where he made acquaintance with Mali Brandt and journeyed also in Italy. So he became acquainted with some of the important figures in philosophy during his time. In 1728, he planned to establish a missionary institute for the Christian education of the native youth in Bermuda. He sailed for America, but he went only as far as the Rhode Island. And because of uh, financial difficulties, when the financial means to implement this plan did not materialize, he had to return to England. So never uh, made it to his, uh, his destination. He became Bishop of Cloyne in South Ireland and there dedicated himself to the works of the Apostolate. So Berkeley, among the empiricists, was actually a religious person. He died at Oxford where he found the Missionary Institute that he was unable to establish in Bermuda. He died at the age of 68 years old. Berkeley's most important writings are treatises concerning the principles of knowledge, which he rearranged in popular form in the work Three Dialogues between Hylas and Pilonus. In opposition to free thinkers, Berkeley wrote seven dialogues under the title Alcipron or the Minute Philosopher. Now, let's go to his general notions. We are discussing Berkeley based on our understanding of the philosophies of Locke and Thomas Hobbes, who were before him historically. So Locke had constructed a theory of knowledge in which the subject was close up within himself, and the object of such knowledge is the idea. By idea, Locke meant our subjective impressions of things. So there is the knowing subject, and there is the object of knowledge and our idea. Okay. So our ideas are impressions, subjective impressions of things. And for luck, that is the farthest our knowledge can go. We cannot go beyond or behind the impressions. And therefore, we can know what a substance really is whether that substance is a material or spiritual substance because we don't have impressions of these substances but of course Locke acknowledged that there must be a substance behind the impressions now since we cannot have impressions of objects themselves then our knowledge cannot go beyond our sense impressions 
Now, while admitting that there must be something that unifies our impressions, we cannot have a knowledge of that something. We cannot have the knowledge of that something behind our impressions. George Berkeley denies not only the knowledge of such external reality, but also the very existence of such external reality by reducing the reality of the external world to the existence of finite spirits and the infinite spirit or God. So here we have to make a distinction because, again, for these philosophers, there are two different substances, the spiritual substance and the material substance. And there is, of course, the external reality or the external world composed of finite objects and there is also the existence of spirits or the spiritual world and the spiritual world or the spirits we will have two kinds of spirits the finite spirits meaning the souls and the infinite spirit which is god okay berkeley denies not only the knowledge of external reality, but the very existence of that external reality. So, if we are going to relate this to the idea of luck, luck does not deny the material substance. It does not deny the material substance, what is beyond our impression. Okay? What he denies, what Locke denies, is our knowledge of that substance or material substance because we cannot go beyond our impressions. Berkeley, for his part, denies both the knowledge of that substance or external reality and the existence of that external reality. It does not exist. That external reality does not exist in itself. Okay? It does not exist in itself. So let's leave it at that and we'll, we'll, we'll continue. So for Berkeley, there's no material world. It's not that, it's not only that we don't have a knowledge of this material world. There's no material world. So even Locke's concept of substance was merely a name devoid of reality. And for Berkeley, there exists only one thing, and that is the spiritual world or the world of the spirits, which is dominated by the infinite spirit or by God, the supreme spirit. Okay? So very clearly, for Locke, there is a material world, a, sub, a material substance, but we cannot know what it really is. Because we cannot give, we go beyond our impressions. Berkeley, on the other hand, denies both the existence of that world, of that material substance, in the knowledge of that. And he only accepts or affirms the existence of the spiritual world dominated by the supreme or infinite spirit or God, plus, of course, the finite spirit. So, the philosophy of Berkeley focuses on the immaterial or spiritual world. And if, if it focused on this, it is because his philosophical meditations were concentrated on solving a particular religious problem. Okay. So there is a motive behind, okay, motive behind this denial of the material world and the affirmation of the spiritual world. Berkeley sought to restore the spiritual and Christian values in the society of his time. 
when she believe is being uh, undermined by the so-called free thinkers the free thinkers and these free thinkers they relied on Locke's theory of knowledge and on his concept of primary and secondary qualities based on this idea of luck okay or using Locke's idea of knowledge these free thinkers fell into incredulity or skepticism and actual immorality okay so they fell into some kind of skepticism okay they already they doubted okay they doubted the spiritual okay and the christian values in the society during his time so berkeley tried to prove to these materialist free thinkers that in last theory of knowledge there's no place for their idol meaning for matter okay for matter and that their whole philosophy is worthless in vain so that is the intention of berkeley i wanted to prove that there's no such thing as matter so you see here although hobbes and berkeley are put together in empiricism they have different takes on the nature of reality totally opposite between hobbes and berkeley hobbes affirmed the existence of the material it denies the spiritual or at least he said the spiritual is just a derivative of the material berkeley on the other hand denies the material and affirms the spiritual and says that it is only through the spiritual that we that the material exists as we will go we will see later on so all that exists in reality is communion of spirits to whom God is revealed immediately and to whom God communicates the ideas they possess. So in this sense, we can say, well, how come he is grouped with empiricists and not with the rationalists? We cannot group him under the rationalists because Berkeley believes in empiricism. He believes in perception. Okay? That's the main position of Berkeley, perception. All right. Now let's go to his theory of knowledge. And this is how he's going to debunk the position or the materialist position that the free thinkers drawn from luck. Okay. We're not saying here that luck is a free thinker, but the free thinkers use the philosophy of luck to advance their own conceptions so berkeley accepts the empiricist teaching of luck that the immediate object of our knowledge is the idea or the ideas meaning our subjective impressions of things however he rejected the distinction of luck regarding primary or objective and secondary or subjective qualities remember the primary or objective qualities these are qualities that inhere in the object they have an objective cause and the effect is also objective example of this of course would be let's say the sizes okay the size the distance because for example size will have its objective you know, there will be an objective source and the effect will also be objective meaning the size will not change okay now the subjective would be these qualities that whose effect will be subjective to us so like for example sound it has an objective source however its cause to us would be subjective it will depend for example sound 
how how loud is loud or how fragrant is fragrant subjective qualities okay so berkeley rejected that distinction of luck the primary qualities like time space space would be the distance would be part of the space motions are not perceptible separately from the secondary qualities like color the sound tactile qualities etc because we know the primary or objective qualities only in conjunction with and through the secondary or subjective qualities so meaning for for luck uh, for berkeley we know about space we know about motion also in conjunction with the sound with the other qualities with the color for example so meaning for berkeley you cannot separate the two because these two qualities are the same impressions okay so if to know means to perceive subjective impressions such impressions cannot be divided into two categories one subjective and the other objective all must be impressions that are felt by the subject and therefore they are all subjective whether it be a property or a quality of time space motion it's still felt by the subject so all of these impressions are subjective cannot categorize them into subjective and objective so furthermore berkeley denies last concept of substance as a mysterious objective substratum because that's the position of luck a substance is something that we cannot know mysterious substratum behind impression berkeley argues that a material substratum which is separate from our sensations cannot exist because if it is a separate separate from our impressions then it is not perceptible in the sense he has you know it makes sense because if the impressions are separate from us how can we perceive them therefore according to berkeley they must not be separated from us okay it is then a term void of significance and is unknowable and inconceivable if you're going to separate this substratum from our consciousness or from our sensation so if it is connected with our impressions as a support of those impressions then it resides in the subject and material substances are cognitive phenomena and therefore they are subjective now in this sense we can say that the idea of berkeley about material substance borders into phenomenalism material substances are just cognitive phenomena because they are connected to our impressions or to our perceptions without our perceptions or impressions they cannot exist because they must be connected to our impressions or to our perceptions as impressions they are connected to our subjective perceptions if you separate them we cannot perceive them anymore okay so they cannot be separate this material substratum cannot be separated from our sensations because if they are separated they cannot exist so it is impossible therefore for matter to be something existing in itself i mean the material substance not substance in itself because again as we've said they distinguish between the material substance and the spiritual substance so the material substance matter cannot exist in itself it cannot be objective okay because it will be inert it will be devoid of thought therefore to say that a thing exists it means nothing more than that such a thing is perceived by us 
<clears throat> because apart from our perception, that material object, that matter, will not exist. It cannot be perceived. And therefore, it cannot exist. So, now, here, this is uh, encapsulated in this famous saying of Berkeley. Omni esse est percipi. Meaning to be is to be perceived. Meaning the material substance, this being of things, exists because they are perceived. They exist in the very act of being perceived. So, Berkeley therefore denied general or universal ideas. The mind cannot represent a general color which would be neither red nor white nor any determined color. For such, like some, such the universal concept of color must be. Hence, only particular determined ideas exist as we perceive them. So, the so-called universal ideas are like names, not necessarily ideas. And they exist neither in the mind, because they are not ideas, nor outside the mind, because it is absurd that there be a color which is not determined. Now, in this sense, it is similar to the position of Thomas Hobbes, that ideas are just names. So there's a kind of a certain degree of nominalism in the thought of Berkeley. Okay, so this nominalism of Berkeley is more radical than luck, in so far as he denies all value to general and abstract ideas, whereas luck uh, imposes only some restrictions upon these general ideas or abstract ideas. So, primary and secondary qualities, substance and impressions, are nothing other than acts of perceptions. They are just mental facts. They are here. They exist because they are perceived. And their existence signifies their being perceived as a mental act or mental acts. So, Berkeley's theory of knowledge reduces all reality to phenomena. As I've said, it's a kind of phenomenalism. The material world exists only as a result of a cognitive act or a mental act produced and existing in a mental act and therefore subjective and not objective. Reality, physical reality, are nothing but phenomena. Now, while Berkeley, so let's go now to the nature of the material world. How would he explain now the material world? Because if he denies that the material world exists in itself, how would he explain the nature of this material world? So while Berkeley denied the existence of a material world, meaning by existence we mean that it exists in itself, and reduce it to a phenomenon of knowledge, he did not deny the existence of the world of spirits, the spiritual world. So he denied that the material world exists in itself. It exists only as being perceived. But he did not deny the existence of the spiritual world or the spirit. He believed that he had proven the existence of the subjective spirit from the presence of ideas. Because ideas cannot be can be produced only by the spirit. And if there are no spirits, how can there be ideas? And since there are ideas, there must be something that produces them. 
and they are produced by a spirit. So if there is spirit, there must be a spiritual world that exists in itself. So after he assured himself of the existence of his own spirit, because he can perceive his perception, he can perceive the material world, Berkeley devoted himself to determining its nature. The spirit is both active, meaning the spirit can produce ideas, and it is also passive, meaning it is a receptacle of ideas. Its activity is revealed in the imagination and in the memory with which we produce or recall ideas, but still in the coordination of ideas. So the spirit is active because it can produce ideas. Okay? It can recall ideas. It can coordinate ideas can associate ideas so in that sense the spirit is active so passivity means that the spirit receives ideas that is not produced for example it is not within one's power to see or not to see the objects that are in this room so in other words for for berkeley the fact that we can perceive okay the fact that we can perceive something that means that this perceived object exists because of our perception now the question is suppose that we are no longer perceiving the object i'm no longer looking at this laptop and if this laptop exists because I can perceive it, if I am no longer perceiving the laptop, then the laptop ceases to exist. But according to Berkeley, there are two kinds of spirits. The finite spirit and the infinite spirit. Yes, the finite spirit may perceive or not perceive. I may not perceive, for example, I may not have impressions or perception of what's going on in the other room. Or it's impossible for me to have perception of what's going on in the other part of the world. But of course, we can say, well, there are other finite spirits on the other side of the world. And the fact that they perceive these objects in the other side or the other part of the world, then that sustains their existence. But the finite spirits, what, where, wherever you find them, will always be finite. They don't stay permanently. And if they are no longer existing, who will sustain the perception? Well, according to Berkeley, there is the infinite spirit, God. So it's the, fi the infinite spirit, the supreme spirit, God, who sustains the existence of the material world. It is through the perception of God that the material world continues to exist. So the material world exists as a mental act of God, who is the infinite, the supreme spirit so in this way berkeley was able to prove to the free thinkers that the material world does not really exist in itself it is actually the spiritual being the spiritual substance who sustains everything including the material world it is the one that perceives the material world and causes its continued existence. A spiritual or the fine infinite spirit is always active. It always produces. It does not, does not receive. 
it produces by way of perception the material world. Okay? So that's the empiricism of Berkeley. It's a combination of phenomenalism and empiricism. But in the end, he affirmed the existence of the spiritual being, of the spiritual world, especially the infinite spirit, because it is the infinite spirit that sustains the material substance or the material world. That ends this very short presentation of Berkeley. Well, any question? Sir, I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. For Berkeley, uh, is it possible to perceive God? Because he's talking about the other way. But for him, is it also possible that man? Oh, yes. Man can perceive God. Okay, man can perceive God. But if the if the next if question the next would be God, it the cause of it, 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 it doesn't work that way. The existence of the spirit, whether finite or infinite, does not depend on perception. What depends on perception for its existence is the material substance, not the spiritual substance. For example, would I say that since I per as a spirit, as a mind, I perceive the mind of other people, therefore I cause their existence, it is the worst my way, because the spiritual substance exists in itself. Uh, I, I was just running the thought that as a clergyman, I think he did this to save God in the picture. When, <laughs> yes. When uh, all others uh, had something to say about God, but uh, could not put him at at the at the beginning of everything uh, god fell in the process of the mechanical uh, thought process of man yeah uh, berkeley just moved the whole thing right up there and said no <laughs> it's god who perceives everything first and then everything else falls into place after that it's the whole idea of berkeley that's why he 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 sort of entered into this debate into this discussion about about empiricism he's the ad man out among the empiricists, not not just the spiritual world, but the supreme spirit, God Himself. Mm -hmm. That's the main. That's the main for me. That's the main idea. That's the main purpose of Berkeley in joining into this discussion.